Welcome. This is the uh, 17th uh, session of our series on the living memory of cities. I would just like to start with the informal uh, notice. Uh, I always do. Uh, this is a, a simple gathering. Our session is uh, being recorded. Uh, it will only be broadcast uh, later. So uh, please, if you do not wish to be recorded, uh, do switch off uh, your cameras and uh, microphones. Meanwhile, there's also another series we've been doing in collaboration with Father Peter Newby from St. Mary's University. And that's a series on sacred space. Uh, the next talk as part of that series will be on 6 December. Uh, that's a talk with Biba Dow from Dow Jones. Uh, Biba will be talking to us about uh, Quiet Marvels, uh, which is a reference to Seamus Heaney. And I believe she'll be presenting uh, the work of Dow Jones uh, for Beavis, uh, Mark's uh, Synagogue, uh, Maggie's Cardiff, Christchurch Spitalfields, and the Leech uh, Pottery, but that's uh, all to be confirmed. Uh, today we have with us uh, Professor Renee Toby, and I hope uh, I'm not being indiscreet by saying that Renee has just been appointed Professor of Architecture at Leeds Beckett. We're very glad to hear the news. And hopefully this will also be an occasion for us all to uh, celebrate it. Uh, Renee's presentation title reads, Creating an Urban Pattern from Opposites, uh, Recollection, Similarity, Harmony and Composites. The proceedings will be very simple. Eric will be chairing the session. Renee will be doing her keynote presentation. And then this will be followed by the usual period for questions. Finally, a note to say uh, thank you to Duncan McDonald, who is assisting with the session at Eric Parry Architects, and our graphics team, in particular, Russell Watson and Roma McCook, who have been updating our website and events programme. And I would now give the floor to Matthew, if that's all right, for his welcome and notices on behalf of uh, London Met. Uh, over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Jose. Um, just to say, uh, it's uh, great to see everybody again. It was great last time we all met um, at uh, Eric's office and were around the, the table recently. That was also nice to see people in person, but um, very excited to be at this session of the Living Memory of Cities. Of course, this is the last one for uh, 2022 and the first one in the Living Memory of Cities next year is Robert Taverner on, I think, the 17th of January. Everyone on this mailing list will get a notice of that, but we're also very thrilled that uh, Biba Dow is speaking um, in a, um, next uh, in a couple of weeks, next week, in fact, uh, in the parallel um, uh, uh, series. Uh, and we'll certainly have our gang there to, 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 to be uh, um, in rapt audience. Um, really nothing else to say from London Met, except uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And we look forward to the uh, to the talk tonight from Renee. I uh, I don't I don't need to to get in the way of the flow, but it's just just such a privilege to um, have you, Renee, uh, deliver this. I'm really looking forward to the the understanding of the city through the media and film that you're going to in, investigate. So, without further ado, um, thank okay. you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Jose, for the introduction, and thank you uh, to Eric, uh, in particular, for hosting the event, and um, and also everyone at, at London Met. So, my methodology to examine architecture through film uh, expands expounds on Plato's cave allegory, in which we as both viewers in the cinema and individuals, or so we think, sit entranced by a set of flashing images put into place by an unseen puppet master, or rather filmmaker. The work that I present here investigates Peter, uh, fi British filmmaker Peter Greenaway and his encounter with Rome. And it was the uh, basis of the work that I did to produce a a chapter in the book edited by Nick that I co-wrote uh, with Tracy Winton, for which I received um, a scholarship to spend three months at the British School of, in Rome, and that's where I did this work. When we, when we watch a film, uh, we create a world in our minds and make new maps of the city 
based on connections we see. This is my uh, diagram of Plato's cave. When we leave, we walk out into the real city, which has become uh, actor, writer, and director of itself. Greenaway came to Rome on a visit, suffered from indigestion, and devised his plot for Belly of an Architect, in which an American, in the style of Henry James, visits Rome in order to prepare an exhibition of the works of neoclassical architect Etienne Louis Boulet in the Monument Vittoria Manuel II. Rome, in film, manifests itself according to a specific filmmaker's perspective, and there are different kinds of Roman films. Well, Italian neorealist films strove to cultivate the opposite of monumentality of Rome, the English abroad celebrates the place and position of temples, monuments, and civic buildings. The monuments in the film are de deliberately framed like postcards. And in case you miss that the Vittoriano is also called the typewriter, this old fashioned typewriter that you see in the lower left hand of the image is often someplace, placed someplace in the scene. It appears in different scenes. It's even being used in one scene, uh, as here where it actually sits next to the model of the building. The first monument is the Pantheon. It gets applauded by the characters and it's the in inspiration for much neoclassical building, especially Boulay's Cenotaph to Newton, which in the postmodern way Cracklight, the architect, plays with in a series of photocopies. Then follows a montage in which he shows how I, he identifies with both the building as the cenotaph becomes his birthday cake and the emperor who built it as Hadrian made it becomes Cracklight made it. The film references other films and paintings and iconic imagery. There's a strong theme of water throughout the film such as this scene set supposedly in a bathhouse, but actually filmed in a privately owned Roman villa. And Cracklight's first name, Stourly, that refers to a running stream. Greenaway weaves, Greenaway's film weaves these strands, Augustan Rome, Humanist Rome, Neoclassical Rome, Mussolini's Rome, and postmodern Rome. The American architect curates an exhibition of Boulay's architecture, while unbeknownst to him, his Italian counterpart, siphons off funds to restore Mussolini's fascist modernist architecture. The architect, however, as architects do, sees himself as somewhat, sorry, this is the scene in the, um, in the villa that looks like the bathhouse, sees himself as somewhat grander and imperial and identifies with Augustus and poses as a deified ruler inspired by the monuments that he has visited. These are all um, stills from the film. The film is full of filmic references. For example, a scene in a photographic studio, which was actually set in a pasta factory in the EUR, references Antonioni's blow up. And another scene at the Arapaches references Bernardo Bertolucci's fascist commentary in The Conformist and the seat of power under Caesar Augustus. This is, uh, this is my methodology. So this is my introduction to how I look at film where on the left, there's us looking at film on a screen. We create a world in our minds, in our imagination. And from that, we make a map. And then after, after the film, we exit into the real film and into um, what's the real Rome. And for us, uh, this is the Arapaches. We enter into uh, the Rome as presented in Vidute and in Postcards. When films use postcards and texts, these things are always mediated by the filmmaker's intentions. It's like the actors. They're both themselves acting and the part they play. Showing the postcards is like characters talking directly to a camera or when actors play themselves in films. And there's a little diagram at the bottom that shows us looking at a map, imagining where we are looking at the place on the map and at the monument and at the postcard and which one, um, which one is real. Like a postcard itself that arrives with no return address and only a, a cryptic comment, post, postmark and stamp to claim its origins 
are the postcard collection from the 1910s and 1920s of Eugenie Strong, the first assistant director of the BSR. I lightly touch on these, uh, this collection that is filed in albums and boxes according to place, like a map that's not yet been made. Strong begins, as so many of us do, with uh, Piranesi's depictions of the monuments of Rome and ends with the 1911 ethnographic exhibition to celebrate 50 years of Italy's unification that shows different pavilions from different regions of Italy for the World's Fair that took place in the Valle Giulia where the British school at Rome is situated. I intermit Strong's postcards with the others of the monuments all the way through my talk. And this is where I introduce Piranesi, the shadow figure to Boulet, known for his atmospheric, intricately detailed depictions of the ruins of Roman antiquity and the famous series of imaginary prisons. He and Boulet were exact contemporaries, born only seven years apart. Piranesi's most famous built project is the piazza and church for the Cavalieri di Malta on the Aventine Hill. This is the famous portal with a keyhole that cites the dome of St. Peter's we looked at here. Just as historically, the frontispiece of a building broadcasts its symbolic functions by means of its figuration and ornamentation, and a city gate presents a clear urban image, a film's title sequence can offer its viewer a lens of meaning through which to read the suite of events. The film begins, the actual film uh, begins with the protagonist and his wife having sex on the train to Rome. Immediately after this entering Italy train scene, the cam camera swings around the Piazza del Popolo, historic gateway to Rome from the north on Via Flaminia. Greenaway lingers meaningfully over the twin churches, framed symmetrically as they were planned to be seen. The camera stops and the opening credits come up on the screen. The formal framing opens the film as if the curtains have been drawn. As viewers, or shall we call ourselves tourists, we feel we're getting somewhere, we've arrived. This still segment of the shot lasts about a minute, which is a very long time in film. As in all films, Belly is, a highly, is highly selective in the Rome it presents to its viewers. Not dissimilar to those maps of Rome that include only the monuments with none of the interstitial fabric, or even Mussolini, Greenaway ignores the medieval and the Baroque. Greenaway originally intended to trace a route through the city, structured almost like a situationist derive, by using postcards chosen for their perspective, each of which connected a monument in the foreground with another in the distance. For example, by using a postcard of the twin churches in the Piazza del Popolo, in which one could find in the background a tiny image of a part of the Vittoriano, the next scene would be set in the Piazza Venezia, and if in that postcard one could glimpse the Colosseum in the background, then the next scene would take place there, and so on. It didn't actually work for the plot, but he does continue the postcard theme. I start here with the Piazza del Popolo, as Greenaway does. The twin churches in which Bernini collaborated with Rinaldi look identical at first glance, though when you examine them at length, they differ in their details. They're exactly the kind of neoclassical church that Joseph Rickford describes as a domed place with a temple portico. They act as a secondary gateway to, the, to create the trident whose central axis leads to the Vittoriano. You can stand in the Piazza del Popolo and look down the Corso to see the neoclassical arcade of the Vittoriano, just as when you're there, you can look up and see the obelisk. These vedute are from before the Vittoriano was constructed. The iconic image of the twin churches is a view historically attended to greet the traveler, foreigner or stranger arriving in Rome by road. The central road leads uh, directly to the Vittoriano, the Vittorio Emanuel on axis. And in Roman architecture, whatever lies on axis is of principal significance. Here's another view before Velagie laid out the uh, ellipse. And in the left here, you can see Trinita de Monte. Equally interesting is the view in the other direction to uh, Santa Maria del Popolo, one of the pilgrimage churches.
which we see here again. Okay, let's go back to here. Neoclassical Italian architect Giuseppe Valletti laid out the Piazza del Popolo between 1816 and 1820. That's here. From designs on which he'd already started to work uh, uh, 20 or 30 years earlier, shortly after, before the death of Boulay in 1799. The piazza functioned in the city as its major entrance hall. The construction of the elliptical piazza that creates both vehicular and pedestrian access to the area above also enacted the Pincio we go, as a tourist dense destination uh, and an area of perambulation. So that is here we're up on the Pincio looking down at Piazza del Popolo and you can see the oval. Valadier's 19th century interventions respond to the 19th century flaneur, walking about the park, the overview of the city, approaching from above rather than entering through the city. This is gate as theater. This is uh, through the gate. This is city as theater. And these are uh, postcards from Eugenie Strong's collection. I spent a lot of time looking at the, the postcards, but also at um, the Duty of Rome. And the Pincio becomes a place, you know, where the city becomes framed behind you for romantic events, for little interludes. And these were often traced over and over and over again by different artists in different eras. And in many of them, we see dogs and uh, the dogs often represent the activity that's taking place. Either they're playing with the, the their noble dogs, playing with noblemen, or they're hunting, or they're looking at the uh, the old Roman drain, or they're they're looking like a hobo, or knocking over a um, a basket of of uh, of flowers or vegetables. But they're always uh, or chewing on a bone. They're always corresponding to something that's going on in the scene. And a view uh, from as if you're from looking down from the Vatican, where you can see um, the Piazza del Popolo on the left. It's before the churches, the twin churches were built, so they're not there yet, but we do see um, St. Mary del Popolo. And now I have a sequence of maps. Maps are how we articulate and navigate space. They don't just show us where we are or where we want to be, but they map out our conceptions of where and who we are. Maps are windows into thoughts and preconceptions, values and the spirit of the times in which they're made. So two people I look at in particular, this is De Rossi and Tempesta. And these are 17th century maps. And you can see the one on the left has a semblance of the twin churches. The one on, uh, on the right shows them in plan. So one's in sort of axo and the other's in plan as if there's nothing outside of the, the walls of Rome, as if it sort of ends at the walls. Um, the Piazza del Popolo is very clearly, it's explicit as the gateway into Rome because it's the only place we see people. We see them coming and going as if they're just arriving or just leaving, as if they're tourists or pilgrims. You can see that more explicitly here. The people outside really look, you know, they're walking with their walking stick as if they're setting off into the country. The people inside the Piazza di Popolo are nobles with a carriage or tradesmen carrying bags. There's a dog in there. And in this particular map on the top right, you can see uh, Trinita de Monte, and um, before the Spanish steps were built, where there was a, a hill that you had to walk up. And here it is again before the construction of the, the Spanish steps. It's another map completely out of scale, uh, but it gives you an idea of where you might be going. And often the maps were originally drawn 
things were added, things were taken away. In this one, we can see the twin churches are there. And it's uh, a long time before Valadier did his um, did his interventions. This is Etienne, Etienne du Perac. And uh, du Perac came from France to study uh, Roman antiquity. And he redesigned ancient Rome as if he, as he imagined it might have been in Roman times, using uh, some ruins and some history books and descriptions. And uh, these were done at the same time as Tempesta was doing his sort of scientific mappings of, of Rome. And Cartero is another reconstruction, imagining um, what Rome might have been um, at the time, although uh, it's a bit like spreading Roman architecture, I described it as like spreading it on toast uh, while you're on laudanum. I mean, it's completely hallucinatory construction. or Duparax reconstructions of Rome. We can see some of the monuments that we're familiar with and other, other items that um, he imagined might have existed, filling in the space. And then later, uh, later maps show the, the 19th century development. But here we see Valagier's ellipse at the Piazza del Popolo on the right-hand side. Map-making architect um, uh, Jean-Baptiste Nolli was an older contemporary to Piranesi. From 1736, he surveyed the city of Rome and created uh, 12 copper plate engravings of the, the great map of Rome framed with vedute, which we send the left and the right on the bottom, published in 1748 and now simply called the Nolly Map. Nolly's fame rests on his figure ground representations of the city, in which built form and private space are both pochade in black and white public space, interiors of public buildings as well as streets and piazza left white. And we get Roma as well as Neptune and Rome's watery history. In 1978, uh, Costantino Dardi, architect and designer for the exhibition in the Greenaway film, took part in an exhibition entitled Rome Interrupted that took as its premise the 1748 Nolly map of Rome and invited nine prominent postmodern architects of the era that included Aldo Rossi, Rob and Leon Creer, James Sterling, Michael Graves, Robert Venturi and John Rausch, urbanist Colin Rao, along with initiator of the Architecture Biennale in Venice, Paolo Portoghese, to reinvent a section of the Nolly maps. And each of them were given a section. And we can see that um, each was assigned a, or chose a particular section. Sterling took the opportunity to showcase all of his other projects and uh, by projecting them on Rome, uh, as did Leon Creer. Well, Venturi reimagined Rome as a Las Vegas in city of signs, and Dardi was fortunate to have as his section the Trident uh, and the Corso and an area that included the Augustus tomb and Trinita del Monte, so the top center. And one of the things that he did, he contrasts Piranesi's imagined of reconstructions of the Campo Marzio, as he says, uh, it's only a few years apart from Nolly's scientific mappings of Rome's public and private spaces that set the tone for scientific rather than expressive mapping of Rome. He compares his lines of greenhouses, I think I have a close up here, of greenhouses, facilities and services with musical staves. So these, the vertical lines are greenhouses and um agricultural things. He compares it to musical staves as well as the romantic lyricism of a plowed field. This was uh, the 1970s. He was very influenced by ecology. 
working with the 18th century city in which the Piazza del Popolo is an oblong with two matching churches, he he plays with linearity in the form of furrowed fields of agriculture and lines of greenhouses, as well as a practical approach that introduces functional aspects of inf infrastructure into the city. The Valadier elliptical layout of the Piazza del Popolo is reintroduced onto the Nolly oblong, and Augustus' tomb is opened as a punctum or node on a reintroduced geometry, both of the river and of the trident. That's on the Ripetta on the left by the by the river. These are this is his description of the agriculture and the musical staves and the comparison. And the uh, Augustus tomb, as Dardy imagined it, opening it up uh, on the top left as it was. Um, in uh, in earlier times in the 19th century, completely embedded within um, the medieval fabric, and on the bottom left, uh, a World War II aerial photograph of um, of the Augustus tomb after Mussolini had uh, liberated it from the surrounding fabric. So the tomb of Augustus is the next monument that we look at. There are different images of what it looked like or what it might have looked like based on the um, descriptions. And Piranesi's image of it as a complete ruin. And the image um, from the film. For the purposes of iconic monumentality and to emphasize the power of fascism, uh, Mussolini's architects isolated key Roman monuments, such as the tomb of Augustus, by stripping away what he termed decadent urban fabric and built new works of rationalist architecture, which, through modernist and abstract, derived their imagery, monumental scale, and political force from classical antiquity. The liberation brought together fascism and the Roman Empire through the freeing of the memorial architecture on the anniversary of the emperor's death, uh, emperor's birth. The intention was to open up the urban design for traffic and a form of urban hygiene by demolishing the existing buildings. So in the film, Cracklight, the architect, steals a postcard of the Augustus tomb, which becomes a vehicle that allows him to walk in front of the Arapachus, which I showed earlier, uh, and he looks at the tomb of Augustus. And it's a direct reference to Bertolucci's The Conformist. And here he's looking at the postcard. I myself tried to visit the tomb of Augustus. And as anyone who's tried it knows, it's rather a non-visit. And uh, we're left, it's when I was there, I don't know what it's like now, because I haven't been to Rome for a few years. It was surrounded by um, hoardings with images of imperial grandeur, a short lesson on Augustus, and a surreal hologram of Mussolini clearing the site holding a shovel, which was you know, the, my strongest experience of going to visit the uh, Augustus tomb. And after this, um, I went back to examining old maps of Rome. So this is Sixtus V plan for Rome that we're all familiar with from architectural history. And in the 16th century, Sixtus V laid out the trident and axis of streets to give order to medieval Rome and link the seven pilgrimage churches. So this is standard fare from architectural and urban history. But I began to wonder, what did it mean? Like, what did Rome look like before the streets were laid out? Just what was this medieval city that Sixtus V felt was so in need of order? So from historic maps, we learn the many ways of charting Rome. Medieval maps in which Rome uh, is the monuments, like here, surrounded by the Aurelian malls, as if it's just like a handbag of, of monuments. Uh, Maps that represent Rome as a lion, uh, or as Augustus city of God, as a square, or as a circle, or as a place of pilgrimage. And previously, Rome was often mapped by looking down from the Janiculum Hill, often inspired by um, the 1100 Mirabilis, a sort of tourist map of medieval times, an image of which I have here, 
it's like a tourist guide for pilgrimage um, pilgrims who wanted to see Rome. In the 1100s, two tourist guides, guidebooks, one for pilgrims and one secular, listed the monuments of Rome and described them in detail as the marvels of Rome. Described as unhampered by any accurate knowledge or historic fact or even continuity of the city. The Mirabilia Urbis Romae describes the pilgrimage churches and the monuments. It describes the Pantheon, which was then a consecrated church of St. Um, Mary Rotunda, as having a spacious portico supported by many lofty columns, also as the idol house of all the gods, or rather, all the demons. The book, do you, excuse me because I'm not a Latin speaker, the Miracles of the City of Rome, written by uh, a master Gregorius, who was uh, an English monk, is very much an Englishman's view of Rome. He's less interested in Christian Rome and expounds on mythology and medieval approaches to the existing monuments. Gregory suggests that the best way to see Rome is as a panorama from the top of the Janiculum Hill. In the 16th century, Fabio Calvo produced a series of geometric maps working from suggestions of both Vitruvius and Alberti. He translated the topography of Rome into quadrants and circles. In views of Rome as a circle, what is at the center is less important than the fact that there was conceived to be a center from which all radiated. In Calvo's map, equally spaced radii extend to the gates of a perfectly circular walled city of Rome with monuments e evenly distributed about the center at which sits the Millarium Aureum or the golden milestone erected by Augustus from which they could measure all distances in the empire. It was situated somewhere between the Rostra and the Temple of Saturn in the Roman Forum. Examining the maps to get a feeling for the development and layout and survey of Rome, the relation of the monuments one to the other, if that's the case, and the axial roads and other thoroughfares, I began to play a game with myself, spot the Pantheon. The Pantheon's the second monument that Greenway presents us with, and it's the essence of classical language of architecture, presents us with after the Piazza del Popolo uh, of architecture. So what, Whatever maps I looked at or whether they were reconstructions of what Duparac imagined Rome to be, we can always find where the Pantheon is. And I found it everywhere, including the top right. That's a photograph from uh, Campidoglio. It's from the mayor's office. And in the office of the mayor of Rome, we had uh, painted along the walls many of the monuments of Rome, including the Pantheon, and none of the churches to uh, differentiate between the power, whether the power was the church or the power was secular. Here we have the power of Rome in the mayor's office. And because I love it, uh, even though it does not feature in the uh, in the Greenaway film as itself, although there is a pyramid at the end of the film, uh, the pyramid, you can always find it in uh, the Vedute and the maps that I was looking at. I'd like to end my map sequence with this tour de force of Piranesi, the Campo Marzio, his hallucinatory reconstruction of what Imperial Rome might have been like if designed in the 1700s by someone on Laudanum. <laughs> and uh, on the top right, the, I don't know, you can't see my cursor, but the top right, there's a sort of oval where the M is, and then to the right of the oval, sorry, the top left, there's an M. And then to the right of that, there's a shape, and that was um, a sundial, large sundial that's described um, in one of the history books of the era. And uh, the obelisk was used as the sundial. And it was not always accurate because I think they didn't have um, leap years, so the time it wasn't always completely accurate. And that was considered to be because the Earth did not always rotate evenly on the axis. It couldn't be. Uh, because it was inaccurate, because it had been erected by the Emperor Augustus, and Augustus could not make any mistakes, therefore it had to be the, the Earth not turning properly. And if you look at the plans, you can't even imagine like what these things would have been like if they'd been made into architecture. So from here, 
we return to a postcard tour of the monuments, starting with the Pantheon and the, the Campaniles that were built and the changes that took place in different eras. And how do we recognize the, the Pantheon? What, what makes it distinct? Uh, the brickwork. So the bottom left is a, a, a reconstruction in Chinachita uh, from the TV show Rome. And the, obviously it's truncated, it's a, like a small oval, but we have the very distinctive brickwork that we immediately recognize as the Pantheon. And you can see Campanile are coming and going and things change and the portico is there or it's broken or reconstructed. And the images that you see on the bot on in these images, uh, the Roman sarcophagus and the lion, the stone lion um, that were in front of the Pantheon were described in the 1100 book, um, the pilgrimage tourist books. I don't know why anyone would do to the Pantheon what Duparac has done on the right. Uh, but anyway, that's his idea of what it might have been like at the time. And this is uh, the Baths of Agrippa and Pyrene a postcard of Piranesi's uh, view of uh, the Baths of Agrippa with the Pantheon in the background. Um, and at the time that Piranesi did this engraving, the top left, uh, the Pantheon was in fact surrounded by medieval buildings. So you never would have seen it the way that, that Piranesi has drawn it, rather than these large ruins that he's shown. And th th anyway, they would never have been that tall. And if you look at the map on the on the right, uh, like you can't, you can't really figure out where he was standing to take that that view. And on the bottom left is an image from the film. And Piranesi's view of the Pantheon as a ruin. And his view of the Campo Marzio as it might have been uh, in Roman times. So I was looking at uh, Duparac's images, uh, the maps and the vedute. And um, in fact, in the library, there were three different volumes, um, three different printings. and. Um, oh, printed over a period of 150 years. So here's one from 1575, and then about 100 years later, and then after that from 1700. Uh, and it's all the same book, but produced over a sequence of time. And there's some differences as well in the change in the title from the vestiges of antiquity of Rome to the conspicuous and wonderful buildings of the ancient Romans today reduced to ruins. So it's a completely different way of presenting the information. And it shows uh, the forum looking towards the Campidolio. And in the image, uh, it's the same scene, obviously traced over, but shown slightly differently. Well, the scene is the same. Here's the first one. Um, it's a field of cows, um, many buildings. Um, uh, capitals of the Doric order. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a field of cows and you can see sort of peasants driving their donkeys and uh, people coming down a stair on the right hand side. And then, oops, a little bit later, you can see that it's become a place of pilgrimage. And uh, the forum is where noblemen come in their carriage to come and look at the sites of antiquity. And the guy's still carrying his sack, you know, in the background, and the person's still coming down the stairs. And then some years later, uh, the person coming down the stairs has disappeared and everyone's slightly tidier and the the old farmers leading their ox, oxes have you know completely disappeared in favor of nobles 
and well-dressed tourists have come to look at the ruins. The cow fields become a tourist destination. And um, the whole thing has uh, become cleaner and more accurate looking as in the mode of the depiction of the building. And these later images correspond to developments in romantic depictions of landscape with a darker foreground in almost all of the vedute, framing them more formally and more pictorially. There was another artist uh, I looked at, Alogia Vinoli, who produced seven books that were meant to correspond to your seven day pilgrimage tour of Rome. And Giovinoli really depicts um, the competition for power between the Roman ruins and the pilgrimage churches. And he, he demonstrates them quite clearly with a little narrative in front of each of the ruins that does not necessarily relate to the monument, but to an event in Christian history, martyrdoms or processions. The seven books that were originally intended to be a pilgrimage are to be done in seven days, seven books for seven days. And so it's quite the visit. And he presents the monuments as monuments as backdrop for action. And the Baths of Caracalla in particular become an operatic setting for all kinds of Christian martyrdoms. Which I found fantastic because the Baths of Caracalla are now the setting for opera and they're used as, as background setting. And there's always an extremely violent uh, event happening in front of them that have nothing to do with, with that particular part of Rome. And in fact, the, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of the, the Christians being thrown to the lions is shown in front of the Colosseum rather than an activity that, take place, that takes place in the, in the Colosseum. And the Colosseum itself is depicted in many different vedute uh, in many different ways over different eras, as if it's reconstructed. And here, the, the image changes, but this guy on the horse, we see him again and again in different images. It's one of Eugenie Strong's postcards and an image from, from the film. And Oops. The, Green, the Greenaway film depicts um, one of the iconic architectural works from Mussolini's Third Rome, the fascist period of Italian rationalist architecture, the square, the square Colosseum in the EUR. We do get to St. Peter's in the film, but when we're more than halfway through, and it appears extremely undramatically. Um, Greenway keeps Michelangelo's familiar dome and elliptical piazza from us until his character has given up his fight to neoclassically dominate Rome and the Romans. We're back at the map. And so we looked at the trident on the left. And now if we look at the corso down the center to where it comes to, here we've got the, the Campidoglio. And how it was depicted in the map with the pilgrimage church on the left. So if I go back to here, you can see the Piazza Venezia. Um, you can't see my pointing finger, but um, that was extended to create this axis that where the Vittorio Manuel is, which I hope you can see in this aerial photograph at the Piazza of Venezia. So bu whole buildings were taken down and moved. Medieval fabric was cleared to create the space uh, for the monument here and it's sent it's central to the theme of the film and it's uh, known as the wedding cake or, or typewriter and this is an image uh, in Cinecittà which was uh, Mussolini's um, film production center film city 
And here in Infinitita are images of uh, of the Vittoriano and of Mussolini laying laying the stone for part of the Vittoriano, which is imbricating the filmic quality of the, the narrative of monuments. In 1937, Mussolini used an exhibit called Augustan Exhibit of Romanness to equate Italy's fascist re regime with the Roman Empire under Augustus. One room was called The Immortality of the Idea of Rome, the Rebirth of the Empire in Fascist Italy. And we started with the Piazza del Popolo, and we end with the monument at the other end of the axis of the Corso, the Vittoriano. This is a postcard of the Vittoriano um, that's shown in the film. And then an image of the Vittoriano from the film itself. And as the film ends, the architect, Cracklight, uh, stands in his exhibition. He's standing on the, on the Nolly map. And these squares, which are viewing squares that look out at the different monuments, uh, were the same viewing, viewing portals that Costantino Dardi had designed for the new street uh, in the um, in Portuguese's um, Biennale. The architect looks down at his feet and he's standing on the Pantheon. And then he looks out through the view uh, at St. Peter's, the same view that we started with at the Cavalieri de, Mont de Malta, looking through the, the keyhole. So Roman monuments each have multiple identities that all contribute to the whole as architectural space and human experience. And to explain my title, I'll say that as a Warburgian Neoplatonist, I've presented my argument through image and gesture in the style of proof that the soul is eternal in five parts from opposites, recollection, similarity, harmony, and composites. And the soul under discussion is, of course, Rome, the eternal city. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, very much. So, um, maybe beginning with your end, we could uh, ask for some some questions. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I thanks, Renee. That was that was that was great. Um, and uh, I just um, was saying to Nick, who unfortunately had to leave early, um, that I'm I am not familiar with this uh, part of your work. And he said, "Well, you should have read my read my book because apparently you explored <laughs> some of these ideas in that chapter, which I haven't read." So it was it was fresh to me. Um, and I think as you were showing some of those images in the way that we've all made Rome our own in different ways, um, and in fact, one of those images that you that you showed uh, were used by Peter Carl on a map that he, uh, on, a, on a booklet that he made for us when we all went on our first year Rome trip many, many years ago. Um, uh, at that, and at that time, it was run by Peter Sparks, but we met Peter Carl oh, yeah. for the first time in, in Rome. Um, and it was just reminded me also of the kind of the patchwork of putting the place together that we re experienced at that time. But of course, we that's something that many of us do in different ways, um, especially when you showed the various images of the Pantheon. I mean, we went through um, the eyes of Greenaway's uh, uh, film, but there were these this variety of representations and appropriations of that building. Uh, and of its uh, various um, kinds of occupation uh, in films, but also in these imaginary reconstructions from Piranesi to uh, Duperac. Uh, and um, some of them were, as you said about du Duperac, quite, they make you ask questions uh, to which you don't have answers. But my question is about these um, appropriations, and it's about what, um, uh, with regard to the relationship between that world that you talked about as being in your mind and then the map that you make of it. Mm. Um, uh, filmmakers uh, and artists make uh, make these different appropriations or, or reappropriate and reconstruct this place differently as they do with other settings. And I just wonder if you have any reflections on what that does to our uh, thinking about the city, whether as architects or as other, you know, whether as consumers or as residents. 
that's a th thank you. That's a really good, really good question. And I think we we all carry with us images in our heads of what a place is like. And it's one of the things that I often say to students when they're going to a place that they're going to see it for the first time, but they're very familiar with it. To see it at night, at you know when it's atmospheric, because it's never going to be the way you might imagine it to be. I remember seeing like San Carlino for the first time and going, huh, what? That's it? Oh, really? You know, but actually it's an, it's amazing, but it was never as amazing seeing it at the, you know, on a busy, you know, with the cars going by as it was, as it had been created in my imagination by my architectural historian professor who'd, who'd really brought Boromini to life for me. So, we have we have this in our in our heads of of cities and cities take on different connotations when they're shown in films that are never like the real city itself and i think that there's there's a, actually a great deal of work on by film theorists who discuss this the difference for example between italian filmmakers uh, and their their films about rome and you know and others like you know, Roman Holiday with Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck, where they go through on a on a motor scooter. They just go like from one monument to the other, as opposed to, um, you know, and Antonioni's films or or other people's films of of Rome that show Rome as it is, either through realism or through the the personal experience and what the EUR is is like, and because in, in contemporary in the contemporary world. We think we know all cities because we can get images of cities. And that has nothing to do with actually the city itself, like being in the city itself. But those two things exist in parallel. And it doesn't mean that one's right and one's wrong. Like I may think that I know Singapore. I've never been to Singapore. Or I may have supervised PhD students who've written about Kinshasa, where I've never been. But I feel like I know it. And if I went there, I would probably be able to navigate my way around, but that has nothing to do with the culture and the experience and the the history of the of the place itself. So, th does that answer your question a little bit? Uh, yeah, it does. I mean, I I, I I think that phrase that you when you said we think we think we know cities, I think that's really interesting because I think this idea that. Uh, when you can appreciate when, when when you think about what those cities have in terms of a depth to them, that this uh, diversity of interpretation is very it's very resilient. Um, and this is obviously one of the things that Rome does for us as a symbol, not just as a city. And Rome, I think there's so many layers. You could, you could spend you're constantly, you know, finding more and more and more things. I did a um, a kind of treasure. While I was at the British School in Rome, I, I was supposed, I, I, I'm glad Nick's not here. I, I, I spent a lot of time working on the chapter that Tracy and I were working on, but I also did other things. And I made a sort of treasure hunt of all the Mussolini monuments and all the images that were left over from Mussolini's time, like the, um, the Roman numerals that, that you know, he, re, he redid the dating. So all the times where the, the year, Mussolini's year are still on the buildings and all the fascist symbols and I went to buildings, I found images of Mussolini on horseback and, and statues of Mussolini that have been hidden away in cupboards. And that's like another hidden map of Rome. I think film is one of the best ways to depict a city because uh, cities are in constant flux and you need the movement of film to really um, to capture that. And the first, the very first filmmakers from the 19th century, the first things that they filmed were cities. Like everyone's familiar with the train coming into the station and then falling off, right? But uh, after, they, after they got over the train, but where do trains come to? They come to the city train station. All the 19th century moving image um, was of buildings being constructed. And sometimes filmmakers played with it. So a whole building would be constructed and then they'd put it in reverse and you'd see it being taken down. The cities and films have always been together. Other other questions? Maybe I could uh, contribute with a an observation. Um, 
I thought it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Renee. Uh, um, the uh, most curious uh, thing I find is really this difference between the, the film and the city. And as we look at it, you put it in terms of the soul, um, the, the, of uh, Rome, the eternal uh, city. Uh, I wonder how you would bridge that uh, gap. Uh, it's probably not a very fair question, but, but I wonder if you could uh, perhaps steer us in that direction. If there's something in between, what would be in between? Uh, the film, um, and not just film, uh, in books, uh, the, the the whole description of cities uh, describes uh, cities which are not the actual city. You know, the, the, the Lisbon or the Prague of John le Carré is not the actual mm. Lisbon and Prague. Uh, the same thing goes for, um, uh, of course, uh, cinema. Uh, in greener way, as in pretty much every film, every film. Uh, we, if we think of uh, not just Rome, but but even here, Brights had revisited the idea of the the memory going back to a place and then how that place changes. Uh, of course, it's an adaptation of uh, of the famous uh, novel. But as you look at the way this was adapted into television and then. Uh, cinema. I haven't seen the film, but I did see the series. Um, they go into one college and then they're, they're doing a run in a different college and then mm -hmm. uh, the MCR connects into uh, something completely different across town. Uh, so there is a topography that is built uh, in uh, cinema for reasons of the, the the filmic narrative, which is entirely uh, different, but it builds it builds our own narrative of the city, it builds our own understanding of what the city is, and it builds an expectation, you know, which you so aptly described. Uh, I wasn't uh, unhappy when I saw uh, San Carlino for the first time. Um, I was very happy to to go there. At the time, there were, in fact, very few images of the interior published. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to see interiors of uh, Roman monuments, churches, you had to go there. Mm -hmm. Most of the, I know this will sound very strange, especially for, uh, I, I now have to say, the younger uh, generation. But there was no internet or, or whatever was on the internet was very, very little. Uh, you certainly wouldn't find images of interiors. And you'd have to go to the library, as we did. And most of the images we had were exteriors, were facades. You'd have to travel yeah. there and see it and experience it yourself. And then there's also an interesting decalage, an interesting gap, uh, which is between the photo you take and the experience of the place because often these interiors can't re be reduced to an image. So film also does that. I mean, it helps you describe the situation in a certain way, uh, but it also builds a new uh, vision. Uh, so it, it's really just a comment, but my question, I suppose, is simply, you know, how, how you would see that um, uh, um, that between, that what, what happens in between one thing and the other is it our imagination well is it our imagination i i can't answer because that's so caught up with so much that we bring to a place and we have imagination it makes us judge things like you know my image of san carlino like it couldn't it could never have been as monumental and amazing as, as the professor made me think it was but now that i've spent time in rome and i understand about the scale i'm seeing it quite quite differently but the idea of the city and the soul, I think, is actually quite relevant for how cities change. And um, one of the conversations that takes place in the 20th century is, uh, can we retain the soul of a city when the center of a city is, is removed, either through uh, for military reasons or for uh, redevelopment? Does the city still retain its soul or has it, has it lost its soul? And I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but it's one of the conversations that that takes place. For for film, and filmic cities, 
I love it that you can sort of turn a corner and end up in a in another city and then someplace else and or Brideshead Revisited. You can create a place out of five different places and it's it's more real than if they'd filmed it in the real place. But and that is how our imaginations work, because our imaginations make something more real to us. So facts are facts, but it are, our imagination is true to us. What's true to me may not be true to you, but it's much it's much more true to me often than than the actual situation, if that makes and and because especially with cities, because that's my experience. So my experience of a place makes it much more real to me. And that has to do with the imagination of what I what I've brought to a place. But it also has to do with what you know about a place. And you know, when we go to places, it's very rare in contemporary times that we go anywhere where we have no idea about it. We don't we don't just sort of land in a place and discover it. We have done research, we have anticipation, we have experience of all of our other cities and complexities that we bring to the place we're, we're going to. And we're architects, so we already bring a, a, love of, a, a love of urbanism and buildings with us. That's quite different from someone else who comes to a city who may not have that affection for the sounds and the smells and the sights that cities, that make up cities. Thank you, that's very kind. Matthew, once more. Uh, yeah, I mean, just in the absence of other other questions to, to take this, this point forward um, a, a tiny bit, because you mentioned uh, this building on what Jose was saying, uh, this question, can we retain the soul of a city or reconstruct it where it may have been torn away in some way. And you also talked about supervising a PhD about Kinshasa. So my mind just made a connection. There is, you know, there's that, that amazing book that I'm sure you've seen of uh, Philip de Burke um, about Kinshasa called, I think, Tales of the Invisible City. And this idea of cities that are built on, yeah. on, on, on something that is the opposite of the richness of Rome's, uh, you know, overburdened inheritance of of uh, monuments um, or cities where the monuments might be built on rumours or, you know, mm -hmm. false accusations or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that this idea yeah. of uh, 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 the way that cinema acts for architects or in the world of architecture between that space of um, imagination and speculation, but also building a kind of pathway that you can think of as part of your briefing if you're an architect. I think that there's a particular um, uh, aspect of the imagination that is so fascinating about film for architects. So it's not really a question directly on the paper, but just because I know it's a field which you mm -hmm. are so embedded in. Are there aspects to the use of film that can point us to um, some of the problems we have with the status of places today? Uh, uh, especially with regard to the temptation to think about places as disposable. Um, I mean, Kinshasa, for example, some of the writings I've read on Kinshasa are about how many of the people who live there don't care very much about being mm. there and want to be somewhere else. They want to be someplace so, else. Yeah. So this idea about cities as just a placeholder for somewhere that you really want to be, which is part of you know this uh, economy of the internet that Jose spoke about as well, um, how does film insert itself as maybe a restorer of faith in places and of imagination with regard to places? You don't have to answer that, but it's just okay. Discussion. That's a good. I'm wow. Well, wait, that's. Can you ask that again? Because I have to think about that. How does how, how can film help in restoring our faith in places? Given that this economy of the image has almost taken our faith in places away, so we often want to be somewhere else. That's. That's something that I think film can do. It's quite, it's part of the manipulation of film because film is real propaganda. Um, that you can make a film about a place that makes everyone fall in love with that place. And it's not just the filming, it's the narrative. It's because film film and narrative are combined. Like the, that's why I have mimesis and diegesis. You know, like there's, there's the narrative. And as soon as you bring a narrative to something, it changes your perception of it. So... If the city is a means to an end, like I've come from where I really want to live in the country and I'm just in the city to make enough money to get out and go someplace else, that's my narrative. 
but I need to change my narrative so that the city has something else to offer me, and then I view it differently. And film can do film can do that, and it doesn't do it like necessarily with a love story narrative, but the narrative of um, you know light and shadow, and romance, romance, and you know in in the romantic sense, and um, adventure and intrigue, or it can do the same thing in the sense of um, I'm thinking about French films from Paris uh, from the 1960s and 70s, like Eric Romer, where he was working like specifically with structuralist principles of the city versus the country. So Eric Romer's films of Paris are really specific, um, that they contrast constantly built form with green space. And they make you feel as though Paris itself is full of parks and gardens, which it is, but it's not quite as open as, as he shows it, but because of his you know, sort of structuralist way of making the films, it, it becomes more open. Films can also make you want to go to a city and um, they can enliven a city and bring it to global attention. And then people will care about the city more when other people come to visit it. And it, so it, it can it can have that resonance. Uh, I live in a part of London that uh, is now uh, everyone knows where everyone knows if I say oh where do you live Notting Hill oh yeah we know that area you know because of that film which has nothing to do with actually the area but it's been fantastic for like financial and economically for the area. And that that takes place a lot. Yeah, I, I agree. I was just thinking also about that relationship between those imaginary topographies, uh, which also Jose was talking about them sometimes being fanciful um, and the real topographies, whether it's Brideshead revisited or yeah. the Rome you see in uh, La Dolce Vita, which creates also mm. the appeal of, of the place in a completely different way. I mean, how many tourists are reconstructing their own La Dolce Vita? Anyway, I see Jose has his hand up. Okay, yeah. but I was, I, I'm just going to say one thing about La Dolce Vita, which is uh, the filmmaker in La Dolce Vita inter, intersperses like location with set, like in many, like back and forth, back and forth. It's really sophisticated. So sometimes you're looking at the real place and sometimes you're looking at the set, you know, with Marcello uh, back and forth throughout the film. So it's completely knit together to create um, that city. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Jose. Yes, no, I was uh, wondering whether you looked at uh, also the way in which uh, film may have uh, somehow um, pushed a certain agenda towards the development of uh, Rome, because uh, uh, certainly the, during the uh, the fascist uh, period, and not just uh, in in Italy, but uh, a bit throughout uh, Europe, and I'm thinking in Portugal in, in particular, there are a number of uh, films that were made of uh, cities, the great developments of the, the state, uh, the achievements of the state. These would be didactic uh, news reels that would uh, be shown before uh, um, the, the main feature film. And uh, those would boost a certain vision of the city, a certain view of the, of the city, which would then uh, eventually also take flesh in, in the um, in the urban development in the opening of the city to large avenues to new urban developments and all that so I was wondering whether that might be a, a course of uh, research uh, too um, between the propaganda uh, and then the the actual uh, initiative of, of taking taking things forward opening the city and building these things I don't I wonder if you if you looked at that absolutely because uh there's I think this is I think this is one of Tracy Winton's line uh one can't compete with the Romans for architecture's propaganda Trace is that you probably okay uh, it's true know, at this point we don't know which lines were which by which of us <laughs> um, but I think you know this, this conversation is so interesting. I mean, first I want to say I, I love the lecture. You just the images you brought, beautiful, beautiful. Um, but because our memory is structured spatially, which is one of the reasons architecture is so important, that 
I think that's basically why the narrative of film is able to um, to re-embed meaning for people who aren't kind of attached to the place. Like, in other words, they're not walking around it um, on a daily basis. And that meaning can be, it's not really free floating, but it kind of begin, begins to be embedded um, in a very special way that I think previously we would have only seen like in ceremonial uh festivals urban rituals you know that kind of which of course rome is very much built on so you know perhaps that that you know those kind of those big settings are are already there um but then um it also shows you why neorealist film was so important because it just it was able to completely shift mm. uh the focus over towards something um much more, I don't know, like at a kind of much more intimate scale where people, where the fabric was really a little bit anonymous in some places mm -hmm. and people would be, like viewers would be able to identify um, with what was happening and kind of bringing it back to themselves. Like I'm thinking, you know, like of the bicycle thief. By the yeah, I, was thi I was thinking of, of the bicycle thief. <laughs> like if you know Rome, you know where those scenes were filmed, but you'd have to look for them but it's not important like you know it's not like oh this is where this scene was filmed this is where this scene was filmed it's the personal story it's the it's very much the human the human personal individual story the only place that you see the roman famous roman monuments in that film is a a, a kind of amateurishly painted uh, backdrop of a set in a basement where some a group mm, of mm -mm. Farmers and everything else is very fine grain. Um, yeah, no, this has been really. I, I love your mask, by the way. I thought that series that you showed of the three uh, different frontispieces pieces of the Campidoglio was really fascinating. Just oh, great! That, oh, good. I'm so pleased because I I didn't know if I was boring everybody with that, but I found that incredibly fascinating, and that's one of the things I spent a lot of time looking at is how the same thing had been presented over 150 years in different ways and telling mm. a different story. Can I just say one more ridiculous thing, which is when you talked about the presence of dogs at the beginning of your lecture, mm. I was thinking, well, you know, it's interesting because Rome so often symbolizes a wolf. Is the dog perhaps a civilized form of the wolf? Um, because dog is also fides. It's also Faith. Oh, fide. Yes, yes, yes. There's, there's, yes. The dog standing into a faithful representation mm -hmm. in some way. That's, and, that's a really good point, and that's where I show that I'm not an architectural historian and I don't understand a lot of past stuff. But yes, uh, somebody else actually asked me about the dog and the wolf, and I just said yes. But now that you've talked about fide and loyalty and loyalty to Rome, absolutely, because dogs are so prominent in the Vedute, in, you know, everywhere. And everyone knows like Rome is full of cats, right? But you hardly see any cats at all in the Vedute. And there's always dogs and they're always somebody's loyal companion. They're the loyal companion of the thief. They're the loyal companion of the noble. They're the loyal companion of the dressed up um, noble woman. So absolutely. So in that sense, uh, yes. The faithful reproduction of the yeah, city. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I mean, one of the things that's absolutely fascinating is the uh, we talk about filmmakers, but there's there's something about the editing and the viewpoint, um, you know, that comes with the camera work as opposed to. So this question of the the editing of uh, of so much and um, to create focus, whether it happens to be um, Piranesi, or it happens to be, you know, the films that you were referencing is is an extraordinary kind of part of the uh, the the representation of the city. And um, yeah, I you know, so it'd be interesting to to know a little bit more about um, that that uh, the way in which you see that editing process um, as part of uh, of the making of films. Editors, 
as opposed to direction, you know, or the, the names we associate with the, the masters of, uh, of film, yeah. Um, <laughs> editing is an incredibly important aspect of filmmaking. And although there's famous cinematographers, like directors of photography and famous directors, you very rarely hear about famous editors, but they're the ones that make or break a film. Mm -hmm. And um, directors and editors uh, don't always get on. Uh, and I think that the, <clears throat> this is my opinion, the worst, some of the worst films uh, are the ones where the director did the editing themselves. Because um, the editor is the one that really creates the narrative. And filmmakers, often film film scenes and an editor might put it together in a completely different sequence, completely different sequence that the filmmaker had never anticipated, but it tells a much stronger story. Yeah. And so, our yeah. and also our perception as humans, uh, we take things in really quickly. So when I say one minute is a long time in film, um, editors know that and they know that, you know, Clips need to be, you know, quite short. We get the point. Yeah, well, the, uh, Greenaway is really interesting, you know, with the draftsman's contract as well. <laughs> this kind of, there seems to be a knowingness actually, and it's, uh, it, it's, and it's, it's part of that. The, the sort of, yeah, techniques of, of filmmaking, which we, perhaps, we're not as generally as aware of uh, as we might be about the techniques of drawing, representation, and construction. But another world. Yes, and Greenaway, who understands all of that, um, makes us aware of it. And that's part of the postmodern language of making you aware of the way that it's being depicted. Thank you. Well, that was uh, that, that just opened up so many avenues of thought for me and I'm sure everyone else. So thank you so much, Renee. And um, I, unless there are any other, you know, kind of... Uh, questions that that come to mind i i would um, i would call it a, an end i do i do say that uh, one of my most incredible experiences of rome was uh, being uh, kind of uh, uh, being with dalibor as we we walked through rome all night actually and uh, at uh, on a, on a, on a visit uh, and then came to the trevi fountain just as it was emerging so oh. you know, at dawn um, it starts very faintly with a trickle and ends as a an incredible sort of stream mm -hmm. obviously so um yeah there's that sort of sense that you said of seeing the city by night actually um that kind of uh, other part of, of filmmaking which is not just the the editor or the it's the it's the the camera you know the camera. It's the it's the control of light and shadow and seen in a different uh, a different light to that of day, which I think is is most intriguing. So in any case, wonderful. Thank you for taking us there, and uh, we look forward to to the next uh, next occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you everyone, and thank you for your questions. <laughs>